This illustrated sermon was first preached at the Vine Church in Mississauga, Ontario, Canada by Pastor Paul Tuck, that's me, on Sunday, November the 1st, 2020. When Eileen Rivello told me that she wanted to share a presentation on the Samaritan's Purse Project, Operation Christmas Child, for the first Sunday in November, and since it's Missions and Evangelism Month, I thought that was a great idea, but I decided to write a fresh sermon on this very important topic, and I actually entitled the message, The Samaritan's Purse. Now, for many years, our church has been committed to the ministries of Samaritan's Purse. While they were still operating warehouses in Ontario, I can remember I personally took many teams of people to do sorting and packaging of the shoe boxes and, and packing them up to be sent overseas. My daughter, Sarah, and uh, Johelen Ravello in our church both went to Argentina with um, Samaritan's Purse, and they gained firsthand experience of how this organization does so much more than just hand out presents. They really do. They do a lot of different things, a lot of different ministries. And I'm convinced that Franklin Graham, the president of Samaritan's Purse, just like his father, Billy Graham, has a passion to share the gospel with the world. And Samaritan's Purse is his way of doing just that. The very name Samaritan's Purse tells us something about the values of this organization because the name is taken, of course, out of the Bible and is based on one of the most well-known stories in the New Testament, a story that Jesus told. It's a story that Jesus told a lawyer who thought that he well, you know what? Let's just read what it says in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, that's Jesus, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii. He gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. I don't think I need to retell this story. It's, you know, pretty simple. It has four characters in it. I guess five if you include the innkeeper. Okay, six if you include the donkey. All right, 10 to 15 people, characters, if you include the robbers. But anyway, it's about a guy that gets robbed and beaten within an inch of his life. Uh, the Bible says he's half dead, <laughs> which uh, you could say is half alive. He's still alive, but he's really getting close to death. Two very religious men, a priest and a Levite at separate times, approach this bloody scene and they decide to do nothing. They just keep on going. The third man, a Samaritan, feels compassion for the man, and he bandages him up. He carries him to safety, and he even pays for him to heal at an inn. Now, 
definitely one of the big ideas of this story is then that we can't really claim to love God if we're not willing to reach out to others. The Samaritan, a man from a Jewish point of view, would have been the least likely role model in this story because the Jews actually despise the Samaritans. But he actually demonstrates to us what it takes to be a good neighbor. And I'll go a step further. He demonstrates to us what it takes to be an evangelist, what it takes to be a missionary, what it takes to be even a half-decent church member. You see, as missionary Amy Carmichael put it, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. And the Samaritan in this story was willing to give a lot to help another person in need. Let's notice what the Samaritan was willing to give in order to help the victim. And let's keep in mind that these three items, the three things that he gave, are also necessary to do the work of missions and evangelism today. So the first and primary thing that the Samaritan gave was mercy. He gave of himself, and what he gave was mercy. Now, we need to understand a, a couple of racial components here. I really need to explain this uh, very, fairly thoroughly, I think. Um, it is implied in Jesus' story that the man who was beaten up and left for dead is a Jew. The person who Jesus is telling the story to is a Jew. He's not just a Jew. He's a teacher of the Jews. He is a doctor. He is a lawyer. Um, lawyer meaning a studier of the word of the scriptures and the hero of the story is not a jew he is a samaritan now samaritans were considered to be traitors to judaism at one time they were part of israel but the hebrew part of them was basically bred out of them by their invaders and they uh they uh, intermingled with um, pagans all around them. And so uh, they adulterated um, their Hebrew blood from the Jewish point of view. Furthermore, they built their own holy place uh, in the mountains they, to replace the temple. And they basically developed their own pagan style version of Judaism. Really, they only believed in following uh, the teachings of Moses. And they didn't go much further than that. And Jewish people hated Samaritans. They hated them so much that when uh, Jews would go from Judea to Galilee or from Galilee to Judea, they would very often go around Samaria. They did not want to step foot in Samaria. Even though it was a, a faster route, they, they often would go the long way around because they just didn't want to be anywhere near Samaritans. You know, you know, to call somebody a Samaritan was a hurtful insult. It, it, was, it was slanderous. To, if you were a Jew and you called another Jew a Samaritan, those were fighting words. By the way, the religious leaders, according to John chapter 8, verse uh, 48, called Jesus a Samaritan and a devil. They said to him, say we not well that you are a Samaritan? and have a devil so not only did they accuse jesus of having a devil but just as bad in their eyes they called him a samaritan you are a samaritan so you see it was an insult yet the samaritan in this story is the one who has mercy on a jewish victim wow and it tells us in verse 33 it says that when he saw him he had compassion now, this word for compassion uh, comes from the word splanksnitzemai, or uh, the verb here, esplanksnitze, which means to be moved in the inward parts. It's not used very often in the scriptures, and uh, I believe that it's always used of Jesus. When he, for instance, saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. It's the very same word uh, that's used to describe uh, Jesus' deep feelings of seeing people wandering or scattered abroad and um, i'm convinced that jesus actually is the samaritan in this story from a, an allegorical point of view you know as a metaphor jesus is uh the samaritan in this story but i'll, I'll talk about that another time 
but uh, he he felt this this uh, Samaritan when he saw that the victim when he saw the man he was moved in his inward parts. You know the Hebrews and the Middle Easterns thought that the kidneys and uh, the bowels were the center of your emotions, and it is true when you feel something very intensely. You could say you feel it in your gut. And he saw this victim. He saw this man and he felt it in his gut. It just hurt him in the core of his being to see somebody uh, injured like that and, and close to death. And at the end of the story, even the lawyer that listens to Jesus uh, tell this story about a hero Samaritan. He has to conclude that the real neighbor is the one who showed mercy. You know, Jesus asked him at the end of the story, which one of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And this expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And the word for mercy here is not the same word. It's not as blanks need say, uh, you know, to feel it in your gut. But he said the one who had mercy on him, Elias. And Elias is uh, basically it's a word for kindness. It means to be compassionate or considerate. It's not as strong as the first word, but yet the lawyer was acknowledging the fact that kindness goes a long way. And certainly the uh, Levite and the priest were not kind at all to go on their merry way and leave this guy suffering. You know, one great way to evangelize is to simply be kind. If you want to affect other people, if you want to share the love of Jesus Christ, just be a kind person, be a good neighbor, be helpful to other people, be polite, be courteous. You will be surprised how many people will inquire about your faith when you live a kind and helpful life. Kindness goes a long ways. In this day and age of people ripping each other apart on social media, um, we need to remember that. Kindness is a great Christian um, character. It's a great um, example of being Christ-like when you are kind and considerate to other people. And remember what Jesus said. We talked about this just a few weeks ago, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good what? Your good doctrine? No. That they might see uh, your good... Um, written word or that they may hear your good preaching no that they may see your good works your good works demonstrating kindness demonstrating uh courtesy and love for other people that's what good works are that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven so the first thing that this Samaritan gave was himself by displaying mercy. He gave mercy, but not only did he give mercy, I want us to notice, secondly, he gave materials. In verse 34, it says, so he went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal. Now, could you imagine how hypocritical it would have been for the Samaritan to feel, you know, to really feel what this man was uh, suffering, you know, the, the victim as he was bleeding and in, in incredible pain, to feel that and then just go on and not doing anything about it. How hypocritical would that be? I mean, when you feel something, when God's Holy Spirit causes you to feel something for someone else, you need to act on it. And so it wasn't just enough for him to, uh, to feel it's not enough just to feel for other people we need to respond by using the materials that god has given us the apostle james insists that you cannot have real faith without employing your material goods to help others listen to what james says in james chapter 2 verses 14 through 17 what does it profit my brethren if someone says he has faith but does not have works can faith save him or can that kind of faith save him was what it literally means if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to them depart in peace be warmed and filled but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body what does it profit thus also faith by itself if it does not have works is dead 
I mean, can you imagine if, uh, if the Samaritan saw this man in his pitiful condition left lying on the roadside, if he had just said to him, well, I really feel for you. I hope, I hope somebody helps you. I hope you don't die. Would that be uh, very nice of him to do that? Of course not. And uh, for us to not help people when we know that there's a need um, is quite hypocritical, just to be blunt about it. We need to use, we need to have mercy for people, but not just feel for them, not just to, to feel uh, uh, compassionate or merciful, but to do something. In fact, I don't think you can really have mercy without exercising it, without exercising mercy. And this man used what was at his disposal. This Samaritan man, he used, he had bandages. I guess he carried them with him in case he got mugged. I don't know. Uh, you know, it was a first aid kit. I guess everybody would carry these things when traveling. And especially from Jerusalem to Jericho, it was a very treacherous, it was almost, it was like a downhill trek through uh, craggy rocks and uh, a, a very, very precarious um, journey to go from Jerusalem down to Jericho. And so he carried with him some, some uh, necessities, uh, a first aid kit and, and some, some snacks and, and some things to drink. But he, he gave him bandages. He put his, put his own bandages that he saved for himself on this man. He poured oil on the wounds and wine. Of course, wine has, um, I don't think he gave the guy wine to drink. Maybe if he was able to, he did. But the wine would have the alcohol in it and it would help to um, sanitize the wounds. But he, 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 he performed first aid. And I'm sure the things that he used, the bandages, the oil, the wine, I'm sure they weren't cheap. He even gave up his own transportation. And that must have really slowed him down in his journey. He put this man on his own beast and then went on his way and, of course, stopped by an inn. And so he, he even gave up his own time. I know that's not a material, but it, it does cost something. So, you know, folks, um, when we think about evangelism, outreach, mission work today um there is so much that can be done by likewise just sharing our material blessings just using the things that we have the samaritan just used what he had and we can do the same thing we can be the hands and feet of jesus by sharing things that we have with those who do not have i have a friend uh mark O'Malia with the brampton prison ministry and i was uh chatting with him uh, on Zoom the other day, and he told me about this annual coat drive. It's the first one that they've ever done. Uh, Brampton Prison Ministry is a new prison ministry. It crops out of uh, the old bridge ministry that closed down, and some of the same staff are involved in this one, and it's a great ministry, and so they're trying to get coats to give, especially to those coming out of OCI in Brampton and Toronto South, and uh, so he told me, you know, we need coats, and uh, and, and so I said, well, you know, I, I think I can get some. And I, I didn't even get the word out before I had six or seven coats, four of them absolutely brand new, tags still on them. Uh, I had a lady give me four brand new coats and some other folks and are, are going to be giving, giving towards that. But, it, you know, if you've got an old coat or a, a coat that's in decent condition and, and you're not wearing it, clear out your closet and give it to somebody. You know, there's no use uh, keeping your closet full of stuff that you're not going to use anymore. You know, maybe you've got a better jacket or a better coat, or maybe you outgrew it, whatever. Give it to someone who can use it. You know, the boxes to the Philippines, and I've done this many, many, many times, the Balik Bayan boxes, you know, it costs about 70 to $80 to fill these boxes, and you can send them to the Philippines, maybe $100 uh, to a remote area, um, but you can put whatever you want in them. It doesn't matter how, what the weight is, um, as long as it fits in that box and it, it'll go in a shipping container. And, you know, we might think, well, why should I do that? You know, why should I put crayons and pens and paper and, 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 and different things uh, um, and clothing, you know, clothing? Why should I give used clothing to the Balak Bayan uh, box, uh, to, the, to the boxes, to the Philippines? Well, you know what? The pastors of these churches that we send these boxes to, this these clothes are like gold. I, I was there in 2013 
the first time I went to the Philippines, um, we had sent a whole bunch of boxes and they arrived basically the same time that we did. We shipped them three months earlier and they just happened to arrive at the same time. And I got to see firsthand um, a, a, a group of about 50 pastors and their wives get some clothing that they desperately needed. And of course, the churches use these clothes to go out into the community and uh, be a blessing. They use it as part of their outreach. And it's like gold. I mean, stuff that, you know, we, 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 we might even throw away. They're happy to have it. I mean, as long as it's in decent condition. And of course, as um, Sister Eileen Rivello is uh, talking to us about the Samaritan's Purse Project, um, once again, you might think, you know, why, what's the big deal? You know, crayons, pens, paper, maybe a little stuffed animal, some toys. What's the big deal? It is a big deal. And, uh, uh, you know, we've seen several videos. And of course, as I said, my daughter and many others that I know have gone overseas and have helped distribute these sh shoe boxes. And look at the looks in these kids' faces here. I mean, doesn't that say it all? And of course, many children and their families have come to Christ to follow Christ as a result of the generosity of these shoe boxes, these, these gifts that these kids would not receive anything probably at Christmas if it were not for these shoe boxes. And so just material things go a long way. I remember uh, years ago, I was in Jamaica on a teaching project. I was teaching uh, some classes um, to uh, some young pastors and some lay people uh, on um, homiletics and, and public speaking. And uh, when I was finished, I remember a young lady approached me at the end of my seminars and she asked me if I had any leftover paper. And I said, well, I have maybe, you know, five or six blank pieces of paper. You're welcome to have it. She explained to me that she was practicing her typing because she, I think she was going to business school or something and she needed to practice her typing. And she said, what about, do you have anything else? It doesn't matter if it has writing on it. I said, well, I have a whole bunch of papers with typing or writing on one side. She said, do you need those? I said, no, I don't. And I gave her all of them and she was so happy just so she, she said, I just want to use it. It's like, I'll use the blank side of the paper to type because paper you know they would buy paper individually and what you you know i could go down to walmart 495 i can buy a whole ream of paper they would have to to buy one piece or one sheet of paper at a time and it was expensive but you know folks it's not hard to give of our material possessions winston churchill once said we make a living by what we get we make a life by what we give you can find real contentment in life by learning to give to others. And so this Samaritan, he gave mercy. He extended mercy to this victim, this dying man. And he extended, he gave material things. Now, thirdly, here's the part that makes a lot of people nervous. You probably won't want me to talk about this. You might want to just turn this off if you don't like talking about money. But in evangelism and missions requires money. And the Samaritan not only gave mercy, not only did he give material things, he actually gave money. It tells us that he gave money. Notice what it says. It says on the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper. So he takes this guy to an inn and he gives him two coins. That may not seem like very much, but a denarius, that's the singular for denarii, was uh, a typical day's wage for a laborer uh, in first century Palestine. According to Mark's gospel, um, uh, one denarius was enough to feed about 25 hungry men. Can you imagine taking 25 hungry men to a, a buffet and, and paying for it? Uh, you know, it would be like that. And um, so it was not a uh, small amount of money to give uh, two denarii, to give uh, a denarius and then another denarius. And that would have been sufficient for most people to even stay in an inn. So he gave him, uh, and it might have been all he had on him. Who knows? 
if he was a smart guy, he wouldn't carry a lot of money going through that treacherous passageway from Jerusalem to Jericho. But then it says he said to the innkeeper, and then he said to him, take care of him. And what, whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So the Samaritan dug deep into his purse and he showed great generosity. He gave some coins to the innkeeper. And then he said, you know what? If it does, if this guy gets uh, more sick, um, if it takes more medicine, if he ends up staying longer than he has to, it's okay. Whatever he needs, I will pay for it. I'm going to take care of it. And folks, what a wonderful testimony of somebody who was willing to, uh, I love that word, that name, Samaritan's Purse. He was willing to open up his purse. He was willing to open up his pocketbook and help someone in need. And folks, I really want to testify to you today that even today, uh, you will never regret giving generously towards the work of God. In fact, I'm going to tell you, it feels good to give. I, I believe that because I practice giving giving and i'm not trying to put myself on a pedestal i'm not trying to to brag uh if i share any examples in this message today it's only because i'm trying to encourage you but i know for a fact that um it, it not only feels good to give i mean i love giving i, I do it all the time um last sunday I, I happened to come across a really great deal on some chocolates uh, that were for at this warehouse. So I bought a bunch of them and gave them to our church members at the Vine Church. I love to give things, especially when I know somebody really likes something or really needs something. I love to give and it feels good. And I know for a fact that you can't outgive God. I love what Randy Alcorn, a Christian writer, says God is the greatest giver in the universe and he won't let you outgive him. <laughs> And I could testify, and like I said, I don't want to brag, and you know, I know um, we're supposed to keep our giving on the lowdown, and I'm not going to give you a lot of specifics, but I'm going to say this. Um, last month, so my wife was off uh, because of uh, knee surgeries, double knee replacement, so she was just, she wasn't getting her full salary, she was getting some insurance money, but not as much as normal, and um you know, I don't make a bundle either, but God really impressed upon my heart to help some people. There were some organizations and individuals that God put on my heart last month. And, I, you know, bless my wife's heart whenever I tell her that I want to do something. She doesn't argue with me. She Sometimes she says, okay, a little hesitantly, but she never argues and says, no, we can't do it. And so we made some sacrificial giving last month uh, above and beyond our church. I don't rob from my church giving. I tithe to my local church, but we, uh, we, we gave this sacrificial gift and I had no sooner um, sent the money off, you know, through Canada helps online. I had no sooner sent this money off this, this sacrifice when I got a call from somebody out of the blue and they told me that they were going to give a very generous donation to help the ministry that I'm involved with, Dismiss Fellowship Network. And uh, if I told you the amount, you might fall out of your chair, so I won't. But um, you can't outgive God. And the purpose, of course, is not for God to to, uh, to reward you. It's that God will keep giving. Uh, he will give he will, God will give through you what he might not give to you. And when he knows he can trust you to be a conduit of blessings, when he gives you uh, money, when he gives you extra funds to work with, if you'll use those funds to help other people, God will know he can trust you with even more. And he will use people to give into your bosom, as the scripture says in Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom or into your lap, some versions say. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you or measured to you. So if you're a cheapskate when it comes to giving, you're going to live a cheap life, a miserly life. But if you're generous, God will be generous to you. If you are generous to others, you'll find that in return, in your time of need, others will be generous back 
to you. So um, we need to think about the money that we give in supporting missionaries, in supporting outreach, in doing the work of God. You know, the Samaritan did not think about the impact of his generosity that it would have on himself. He, he saw the need and he just responded. He didn't think about um, the fact that this was going to cost him a lot of time. You know, he was probably on a hurry to get through that treacherous passage from J Jerusalem to Jericho. Um, the risk of his own safety, that's another expense that he paid. He put his life on the line, really. The financial expenses and many more. Um, he really did so much and he didn't even think twice about it. He just did what was needed. So we look at the Good Samaritan and we see that he gave, he extended mercy. He gave of his material possessions, his materials, and he gave money in order to help this person. I guess you could say that this Good Samaritan was really God's Samaritan, if you don't mind me playing on words here. And you can be God's Samaritan too. You know, I know that uh, many of us are not wealthy. I know I'm not, but God just keeps, uh, you know, um, taking care of me. There's always food on the table, a roof over my head. I want to encourage you to give to missions and evangelism. For those who are from the Vine Church, of course, I have been challenging you to use the month of November. We are emphasizing missions and evangelism outreach for the month of November. And uh, I want us to take this opportunity to try the Lord and to take him up on his promises that he will um, give through us. And we can do it. We can do it. We can give mercy. We can give of our materials. You know, clean out your closet, declutter. You know, everybody's talking about decluttering. The best thing you can do when you declutter is give those things. Uh, you know, you could take them down to, uh, to a thrift shop, but better yet, why not take them down to a mission center or to a, to, um, a halfway house or, or to, a, uh, to a, sh a shelter, whatever, or, or give it through your church. Clean out your stuff and give of your material goods and give money. And of course, this is beyond the tithe, you know, the tithe is the Lord's, um, you know, at least I practice that way. I know we're not under the law and I'm not going to get into an argument about that, but you know what? Um, I think that living off of 90% of what God has blessed me with is plenty. And, uh, and uh, he just keeps on giving and giving and giving back so that I can give and give and give back to his work. And uh, we practice at the Vine Church faith promise giving. So uh, we want to build up our faith promise fund for the month of November. And those of you from the Vine, I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Because what we're going to do for the month of November, we're going to try to build up our funds as much as possible. Not robbing uh, tithes to do this, but giving extra towards our faith promise fund. And then at the beginning of December, we're going to vote to send uh, Christmas funds to missionaries around the world and local outreaches as well we're going to do that and it's fun it's fun to give when you know there's a need and you know you're fulfilling a need it's so so satisfying so let's do our part do your part to reach the world you may not be a rich person you may not be billy graham that you can get up on a platform and preach to thousands of people but you can give mercy you can be merciful you can use your materials, the blessings that God has given you and things that you really don't need anymore and they're still in good shape. Give them, give them and use them and your money. Don't be ashamed or afraid to trust God and give money towards the most important cause on the face of this planet. May God bless you as you consider the Samaritan's Purse.